Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Welcome to episode 99 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's so exciting to have almost got to 100 episodes. And today we are talking with one of my actual uh, coaching clients. She's here to uh, share her own experience with dealing with SIBO and the amazing recovery that she has experienced um, with how she was at the start and how she is feeling today. So, Lizalee, thank you so much for coming on to the Healthy Gut Podcast today to hopefully give some inspiration to some of my listeners that, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to sharing my journey. So let's talk about the start. What was going on when you first went, hmm, I'm not feeling so good. I, I think I need to look into this. It was probably around 2011, and I just had not been feeling well. Brain fog, I was tired all the time. I was looking at food like it was the enemy. I never felt nourished. I was hungry often, or I just couldn't find my way with food. And I decided to see a new naturopathic doctor. And so she saw me, we did a bunch of blood work, and A week after I had seen her, I had what I call the episode. I refer to it as the episode. I had eaten a handful of nuts, and about 20 minutes later, my heart rate shot up. It my resting heart rate's around 60. My heart rate went to over 150. I turned beet red, my eyes turned red. The the light in the room started to change, and I was like, oh heck, I'm having a reaction. So I took Benadryl and it just continued. I started to feel confused and um, called my significant other and said, I need, I need to get to the doctor. Something's wrong here. And so I went and they, sure enough, I was having a, a reaction. They gave me steroids and more Benadryl, but my heart rate was such that they couldn't give me any epinephrine. So they sent me home and for... I just never felt good. All of a sudden, I would start to get these same races in my heart, and the light in the room would change. And so the doctor had suggested that I go see an allergist, which I did, and he tested me. And he said, you don't test allergic to anything except cockroaches and trees. That's it. (laughs) Nuts, nothing. So he thought it was my thyroid. So I'm still having many episodes, um, nothing major like I did, but sometimes it, always in the middle of the night, they'd wake me up with heart palpitations and pounding, ringing in the ears. And the only thing that seemed to help me was Benadryl. Um, I didn't want to eat. I dropped a ton of weight very quickly, but I saw an endocrinologist and she says, your thyroid's actually doing just fine. And But she put me on a little bit of progesterone, and when she did that, this is about six months into the journey, I started to feel a little better. I started not to be so reactive, and it seemed to taper down, and the only time I seemed to react is if I would eat nuts, and then eventually it became fish or shellfish. So this went on for about five years, roughly, that I was... I thought I was doing fine as long as I stayed away from these things. And if I had had any of those, sure enough, I'd have a little reaction. I'd take some children's Benadryl and I'd seem to be okay. I started to eat plant-based around uh, 20 into 2015. And I started to feel better. My brain fog went away. My energy felt much better. I was doing that for about six months. And then all of a sudden I woke up in the middle of the night massive episode. My heart was pounding. Um, I was shaking. I was so cold. I was hot. I was restless. And then my heart started to go more. So I took Benadryl and it seemed to help for a little bit, but it didn't do what it normally did. And so for a few days, I was still off and on experiencing episodes. And that was really unusual because mine typically would only happen in the nighttime. 
So I started doing more research as to what could be happening. And I had heard about histamine intolerance, I don't know, six or seven months before this, and I kind of poo-pooed it. But it started coming back into my mind again because nobody was helping me. They weren't doing anything, so I knew I had to be my own advocate. And I started doing more research. And the more I researched, the more I realized this sounds like me, histamine intolerance. And it just so happened that a naturopathic doctor was giving a talk on histamine intolerance, and I missed it by one day. <laughs> so I called her and I got an appointment with her. And within 10 minutes, she's like, this is what's going on. You have histamine intolerance. But histamine intolerance is usually a symptom of something else. So through more research, SIBO really came up for me. And SIBO, it made sense to me. I had had I had had a mild case of food poisoning about six months before the food, the episode that I had. And I also had had another odd incident a few months after that where I had eaten some chia seeds and my belly bloated really badly. I also had the heart thing. My heart kind of ran up. I started to get red in the skin and I took a Tums and a probiotic thinking that might help. And again, the Benadryl is what helped me, but I didn't make the connection of those two things with the large episode. So this doctor put me on some natural remedies for histamine and also suggested a low histamine diet. I started feeling better within about a week's time and I just gradually continued to improve, but I wasn't willing to settle for the symptoms to be manageable. I wanted to get to the root cause. So that's when I started researching more and the SIBO is what really became clear to me. And for some reason, she wasn't willing to test me for SIBO. She didn't feel like the test was going to really show me anything. And my gut, no pun intended, was telling me I needed to be tested for SIBO. So I decided it was time to find a new practitioner, and I found a functional medical doctor in the Santa Cruz area, and I went to see her, and with it, by the end of our first conversation, she goes, I think you have SIBO. And she tested me, and I tested positive for methane and hydrogen SIBO. So she also tested me for my histamine levels and my Dow levels, which Dow is an enzyme to help digest histamine in the gut. And yes, my Dow was low and my histamine was elevated. So she backed up and gave me a therapeutic medical validation of what was going on. So she put me on to a round of Zyfaxin as well as Neomycin. I had decided to go the antibiotic route instead of naturals because I found that I would react to a lot of naturals, which was unusual for me to do. So I went on to that and um, I felt better. I felt much better after two weeks of that. And then she was putting me on to a detox with powders and some other supplements right after this. And I didn't respond very well to that. I had what I thought was a relapse with my SIBO and I got sick for several weeks. And I gradually came out of that and I was still, we retested for SIBO. I was still clear of SIBO. And so she suggested to start to eat with a SIBO diet. And I, anybody that knows me knows that anything with more than five ingredients is too much for me. Food has just always been this thing that I can follow a recipe, but I'm not so great at putting meals together. And I felt lost. It's like, how the heck do I eat? Here's a list of foods. How do I eat? And I knew that, that she wasn't going to be the one that could help me with the next phase of my healing with the SIBO. So I went back to doing research and trusting my gut. And I found the Biome Clinic in Australia, went to their website, saw your wonderful recipes, and looked at the biphasic diet and just felt like that was the connection for me, that that diet would work for me. And then I went to your website and found you and the rest, as they say, is history. 
<laughs> it is what a wonderful history. And it's so interesting hearing your experience to date laid out like that. And it's, you know, with hindsight, you can see those critical junctures, those critical moments in time where things were failing, where the body was screaming out and saying, I really need you to listen to me. Something's going on. But when we're going through it at the time, we can often miss it. We're busy. We don't connect the dots until we look back. Um, it's really interesting that you had that experience with a practitioner who didn't want to test for SIBO and you listened to your intuition and found someone who did. And, and I really want to kind of pause on that because that's common, that experience of having a practitioner that perhaps isn't the right fit for us is common and what I hope my listeners can take out of that is it's okay to go and find somebody new it's okay to listen to your instincts your gut intuition it's there for a reason and do what's right for you and I talk a lot about building a dream team of people and, and sometimes people are there for a moment they're there for a season they're there for a lifetime um, sometimes they don't have the skills or the expertise that you need at at that moment in time and so it's totally fine to go and find the person who does and if they if you've got a practitioner who you just are not you're just kind of not sure of you're not quite it just doesn't feel quite right again listen to that tune into that why are you feeling like that is there a reason that because they're not bringing to the table what you need is that that your personalities don't gel you know, really listen to what you're what you're what you're feeling because more often than not what I because I now work with so many people from all around the world I hear these types of experiences almost daily and um, so often we know intuitively the path or the things we need to do or the people we need to lean more towards yet more often than not, we talk ourselves out of it because we think, well, what do I know? I'm not a doctor. I don't have any experience in this. But when I say to someone, just tell me, where do you feel this came from? Where do you feel it stemmed from? And they'll say, well, there was this one time that X, Y, Z happened. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's investigate that further because that's possibly the reason why. You've gone to that immediately. Let's, let's hash that out and see if that truly is the case. So by the time you found the biome clinic and for those of my listeners that haven't heard of that that's dr narala jacoby's website and clinic she's australia's leading SIBO doctor uh, she's also the creator of the biphasic diet um, and is the diet protocol that i myself followed and then wrote my cookbooks and meal plans and cooking shows and cooking classes and all things food related based on her protocol so do check it out uh, if you haven't heard of it um, and I've got links to that in the show notes. So, Leslie, when you um, found the Biome Clinic and therefore me, how were you feeling at that point in time, symptomatically? Talk to what you were experiencing, if you can remember. At that point, I, I was actually feeling pretty good. Like I said, I had, I had gotten sick from the detox that the doctor had wanted me to do. And I was feeling a little scared about eating because I did not want to have more reactions or more symptoms. And I, I didn't want to do the, the wrong thing. So I was eating just a few things that I knew were safe. But I also knew that I didn't have SIBO, but I did at that point, but I didn't know what else might be going on. So I wanted the hard work that I had done to not be for not. I didn't want to blow it by eating the wrong stuff. I was dedicated and still am dedicated to my health and my healing. And when I found the website and then found you and the food information, I felt excited and I knew that that was the next step in my journey. When you were talking about practitioners and how finding the right person is important and finding the right team is important. That's my belief as well. It truly can sometimes take that small village, you know, to, to create the health you need. And not every person can be the expert through your entire journey. Like this functional medical doctor I worked with, I still work with her. She's still my doctor. 
And she got me to the point I needed to be, but I knew she wasn't the correct one to do the deeper work for me. So being okay, realizing that that one, there may not be one person for your journey that gets you to where you need to be. And it's okay to be your advocate, to trust your gut, to do your research, because nobody knows you or your nuances like you do. And it's easy for us when we're feeling ill and we're frustrated and we're freaked out to give our power away, forgetting that we truly have a lot of power and we're the best person to do the work for our healing. Oh, yes, we are. And we often forget that, that we think we put, and I have done this myself, where we put all our faith and trust into a medical professional thinking, well, they went to university and studied medicine, so they must know much more than I do. But actually, we're the only person on the planet that knows our body as well as we do. And we intuitively know what works and what doesn't work. And the number of times in the past before I knew about SIBO, before I knew about anything related to gut health, um, where I'd be told, you know, oh, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. And I'd think, I just don't, this doesn't feel right for me. I know that's not going to work for me, but I'd put my faith in them, I'd follow up blindly, and I'd get worse. And I knew it. I knew I was going to get worse, but I trusted in the doctors. Now I trust in myself, and I have a lot stronger voice to stay, say no or to challenge something or to question something. And I think that's important. It is, you know, and I did that exact same thing when the doctor had me go right on to a detox where I was taking in um, protein powders and supplements. And every day that I drank that supplement, I was saying to myself, this doesn't feel right. I shouldn't, I don't think I should be doing this right after coming off the Zyfaxin. And did I listen to myself? No, I, I didn't. I thought, no, no, it's just a detox. It's good for me. And then I drink it and feel the same way. And within about a week and a half of being on it is when, you know, I took a turn. So it's very true. I also had an experience with a detox and similar thing. It was far too intense for my body. I just went into a terrible state. It was before I discovered SIBO. It was one of the um, precursors actually to finding SIBO. Uh, but yeah, detox and I, oh, jeez, <laughs> <laughs> It was terrible. I'm with you. <laughs> now I get asked a lot by people, you know, what's coaching like with you? What, what can I expect? What do you do? And so it's always great when somebody who's actually been working with me for a while can talk about what is it like to have a one-on-one -on -one coaching um program with me because you're you're the best person to describe it <laughs> <laughs> well the way I would answer that is that you're going to get exactly what you need and things you didn't even realize that you needed um, when I went in and decided to do the coaching with you I was really just sort of wanting help with some meal planning and you brought and you gave me that and you brought so much more to that you reminded me about my and I work with clients with mindset, you know, quite often. But you, but when you're not feeling well, and you're kind of in a tizzy about your health, sometimes you can forget those things. And you reminded me to be in that calm state when I'm eating, to be grateful for the food and how it's nourishing me. And you also gave me that support of realizing I'm not alone in this. You've been through this, and you knew, even though our journeys. We're similar. We also have differences. And you reminded me of that. And I think really one of the funniest things about the coaching that recently happened is you remind us how to integrate back into food. Like when we want to dive into that bowl of pasta, <laughs> it's like, no, no, let's do this instead. But when I said to you on our most recent coaching that I wanted to now start to look at eating out so when I went to go traveling or see somebody and you you brought me back to well you haven't exactly tried onions and garlic yet you haven't reintroduced those things and that's in a ton of food out there so you keep it real for me and you keep me um, on that forward path of realizing that I'm getting through this and there is hope and light on the other side and everything I'm feeling is valid and it's wonderful working with you. 
Oh, that's so lovely to hear. Thank really? you. you um, and one of the things that I've been really excited to watch, and I'd love for you to talk a bit about this, um, because this is where it really brings hope to people, is around that food reintroduction. So when I think back to our very first coaching call, your food choices were somewhat limited, um, particularly because you're, you're, you're not eating... Um, you've really gone to a plant-based diet so that obviously um, does reduce the um, options that are available to you and particularly options that are suitable for a gut that's recovering as well um, and and so one of your original goals was I just want to be able to eat a little bit more food I want to have a bit more diversity in my diet and so we really had to start at basics and um, you know, start to that program of food reintroduction. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, those early days, the types of things you were eating and, and really where you've been able to get your food to to this point? Okay. Um, well, I really was, I started out with biphasic level one and two, very restrictive level one. And then I moved into the biphasic. So I was eating, you know, certain vegetables, tiny amount of fruit, I did go back into eating animal protein with your encouragement and letting me know that this might be a temporary thing for me, but I realized I needed to eat some animal protein in order to heal. And so I would eat, you know, chicken, organic meats, basically chicken, some buffalo, uh, eggs, I can eat eggs. And then just the range of vegetables that I could eat. There was also basmati and jasmine rice and soaked quinoa. And I discovered with your help that I do better on jasmine rice than I do basmati rice. And I can eat the soaked grains. Uh, and it was wonderful to have that little bit with a salad, have a little bit of the lentils and some of the sprouted um, mung beans that are on the diet that I could eat. A small amount of those. So that was wonderful. And I just gradually grew in confidence with the foods that I would eat. And with your guidance, I would then begin to add other foods back in. I think the very first thing I tried was, um, what was the very first thing I tried? I think it was cauliflower that I actually tried, which can be problematic for SIBO, some cauliflower rice. And I had just started with a little bit, like a tablespoon maybe, and I seemed to be fine. And the next day I added a little bit more and I was fine. And then I added some more. And now I can eat cauliflower with no problem. I can eat broccoli. I, I really, uh, the most recent thing I introduced was garlic and onions. And I seem to be absolutely fine with those. I eat, now have reintroduced um, gluten-free pasta. And that one was a little tricky to reintroduce because I wanted to dive into a bowl of pasta. Oh, gosh. But I didn't. I made myself eat a tablespoon because I knew that was a food that could be problematic. And now I, I can eat a two-thirds of a cup of pasta. I could probably eat more, but I don't want to try more. I don't need more than two-thirds of a cup. I was just going to say, for those of you that haven't listened, take a listen to my interview with Sandra Tenge around food intolerances and also food reintroductions and you'll you'll understand why this um very small portion in the food reintroduction stage is actually really useful because you're testing your body's capacity at that moment in time and if we if we want to do a food a true food challenge where we're saying you know body are you allergic to this food we might give it quite a lot of that but when we're actually wanting to bring it back into our diet, we don't want to go into a huge flare. So we start with really small quantities like a tablespoon, a teaspoon, half a teaspoon. It depends what the food item is. Um, if you can talk to that, because that often, uh, so some people often think, oh, what's the point? What's the point of having a tablespoon of gluten-free pasta? I, you know, who cares? I don't. I don't want to do that. I just want to eat the whole bowl. Let's talk <laughs> about going from, you know, obviously the mindset around choosing to, to food reintroduce foods and the mindset around choosing to go slow and low and slowly build up to that two-thirds cup. Um, how was that? Was it a struggle? Did you find it easy? Did you have to kind of talk yourself uh, through each step? 
uh, because that can often be a really scary moment in time for people when they're ex- when they're trying to experience new foods again. That's a good question, hey? I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We'll be back in a moment. Let's talk about going from, you know, obviously the mindset around choosing to to food reintroduce foods and the mindset around choosing to go slow and low and slowly build up to that two-thirds cup. Um, how was that? Was it a struggle? Did you find it easy? Did you have to kind of talk yourself uh, through each step? Uh, because that can often be a really scary moment in time for people when they're ex- when they're trying to experience new foods again. Exactly. And yes to all the above. You know, it, it, it was scary because I did not want to go back into a flare. Um, but yet I had been deprived, like so many of your listeners, I'd been deprived of some of my favorite foods or just flavor in general that I wanted to jump in and eat that. But having the wisdom to start small is the difference between having a flare and not having a flare or maybe setting yourself back several weeks. If, if you realize you've been without this food for a long time, have a small amount, get to know it again. Is it a friend for your body? Is it not a friend for your body? You're worth taking it slowly because the reward is you can then very likely be able to have it. But if you can't, then it hasn't caused your body any harm. It hasn't caused a setback for you. And there were certain foods that were easier to do that than others. Like I said, the pasta, I wanted a big bowl of pasta. Oh, God, I wanted it so badly. And to think of eating a tablespoon, it was like, why bother? Why bother? And then it's like, no, Leslie, that's not that it is a bother, you know, because you love this food. You're worth taking it slowly to see how you do. Other foods like broccoli and things, that was easy to take small bites of, you know. Um, Gabonzo beans, I actually ate some gabonzo beans, and that is something I used to absolutely love. And that was hard. I, On one hand, I wanted to just dive in and have the gabonzo beans. On the other hand, I know they can be a big problem for people with SIBO. A lot of people have issues with the legumes. So taking that slow was also a way for me to take charge of my health and my healing. I was in charge of things. And that was incredibly empowering that I knew I had control over whether I put that much that food in my mouth and how much I put in my mouth. That is really uh, empowering and very liberating to, um, you know, it's, it's important to feel like we've got control because quite often we feel so out of control. And the food area is one area we can control. It can be a double-edged sword, though, because we can. It can be the one area we control, so we control it so rigidly, and and then it's hard to overcome our rigid rules around food to then start to expand the diet again. Something that I'm really excited about is so one of the things that I do in all of my coaching calls is check in with my clients at the start of the call and find out what they're wanting to work on. Uh, and our most recent call, you said, like you've just talked about, I really want to be able to eat out or go to another person's house and eat eat out. And so we we went we workshopped the foods that are commonly used in a restaurant setting, and obviously onion and garlic are massive culprits out there and I'm so excited to hear that you can now eat them and for some of my listeners they'll think I can't ever imagine eating them again how did you go about bringing them back in because they are often like red light foods for so many people right well I started with basically some garlic oil just using olive oil with garlic infused and I did fine with that And I was using green onions and leeks, and I knew I was not having any issues with those. They're in the onion family. So I decided to take, and with your guidance, one food at a time. So I started with onion. 
And I did one tiny little slice off of the onion in a stir fry of vegetables. And we had talked about having a bigger base of food and just a tiny amount so it kind of gets lost in there. I didn't have any issues. I didn't have any burping. I didn't have any burning in my stomach. And so I think I waited a day after that just to make sure. And then I added a little bit more. And so I did the process because onions and garlic are such a big trigger for people. I chose to take that over about a week time of testing it instead of just doing it a few times. But each time I would gradually increase. No, actually, I sorry, I took closer to two weeks because it was about an every other day thing that I did. And I kind of got up to the normal amount of onion that I would have, which might be the most I would ever have at one point would be maybe a quarter of sauteed onions on some, on some food. And I've had no issues. I did the same thing with garlic, one little tiny sliver. And garlic, garlic was the one that I was really concerned about because you hear people, God, oh my God, garlic kills me. I can't have it. So I was really hesitant. So I took like a little sliver and then cut that in half and just worked my way up each time. And I watched for any signs, any symptoms of any adverse reactions. And I didn't have it. And so right now I'm probably up to maybe a quarter of a clove, maybe a little bit more than that. And I seem to not have any issues. I really feel like I could have a half a clove or a clove, but I choose to continue testing it because I know food in restaurants can often have more than a quarter, but I feel very comfortable and confident with being okay with those things. It's just so exciting to hear when my clients get to the point of reintroducing the, you know, the, the way more challenging foods like cauliflower and onion and garlic, and it just brings back so much freedom. Let's talk about that concept of freedom and the, and just the emotional aspect of knowing now that you could go out and eat in a restaurant and if there's onion and garlic in the food, it's not going to absolutely kill you. How is that feeling for you? Oh my gosh, that feels, um, it feels both amazing and freeing. And yet with that comes a sense of greater responsibility, but in a really good way, because I may not always ha have control of things, but I'm always in charge. I'm always in charge of how I respond to something, of, of what I choose to do. And so to know that I could go to someone's house and say to them, you know, could you maybe cut back a little on the garlic? And I'm empowered to say that to them. Or to feel like I could go out and feel some sense of normalcy around food feels absolutely liberating to me. Um, and again, you know, there's... There's also that, well, after I eat that, what if something happens? You know, what if I did kind of push it too much? But I'm, I'm at the point and I'm of the mindset that if that happens, I have tools that I can use to, to lessen any impact that I put on my body. Like go right back into eating the next meal or two very simply or doing one of my shakes that I like to do and and reset my system. So I have some tools that I can use that it's not going to be the end of the world. And it doesn't mean if I have a reaction, oh my God, my SIBO's back or, or I, I spiral into that downward spiral. No, it means, okay, I just need to change some things. So it's really empowering as well to know that. And I refuse, I refuse to live my life in fear about around eating or about going out. And sure, I'm going to have bumps and I'm going to have some minor setbacks here and there, but I'm going to, I'm going to power my way through them and be smart about it. And I have people on my team that I can talk to if I need the support. And that is so important. It's so important because there was a time in my life that I, I wallowed in having this happen to me when I went through a lifetime of eating whatever I wanted. And I, oh my God, poor me. And it's so easy to happen because it is you get angry about not being able to have what you want to have. And so I remind myself there's, and I know this probably sounds corny, but there's always worse things. And there are. But I choose to see the gifts in what's happened to me. I choose to see the gifts of how I'm living my life. And that 
I'm going to manage this, if not fully heal it for the rest of my life. And that's empowering. It's happened. I'm dealing with it. That's a really important point you make there around management and the mindset. And it's something that we I talk a lot about in my one on one coaching with my clients. Um, and it's not talked enough about in the more broader kind of medical uh, component when it comes to treating SIBO. We think a lot about I've got to kill the overgrowth. I've got to get my gas numbers down. I've, you know, all of those things. It's, and it's quite aggressive in the, if you really stop and think, that's very aggressive thinking. What we don't talk enough about is our fear, is our sadness, is our depression, is our anxiety, is our feelings of being isolated. And this condition can create all of them all at once. Um, and, and the fear of the future as well. We're so scared we're going to be left feeling like this for a lifetime. Or when we do start to feel better, we feel very nervous that we might lose it because we know what it's like not to have it. So we're terrified of a relapse. Uh, and yet, and, and for many people, we also think it's a once and done. We think, well, I'll take the antibiotics and then I'm good but we're not addressing why did we get sick? Why did our small intestine fail and allow an overgrowth in the first place? What I really like, Leslie, about what you're talking about is the management and that you're in control and that there may be setbacks or speed bumps along the way, but it doesn't mean it's failure. It just means that that's a moment in time whereby you've had a little hiccup and no life is perfect. There's always a little hiccup. I like to see our hiccups as a chance to learn and it's a message from our body saying, hey, you just pushed that a little bit or I'm not ready for that thing that you just gave me. And I still deal with that. I'm five and a half years in from my original discovery of SIBO. I still learn every single day from my body on what it's capable of and its capacity. Let's talk about the mindset component because that is so much a, a factor of the work that I do with my clients and, and the fear and anxiety and nervousness, uh, at, particularly around food reintroduction. What are some of the techniques that we talked about, whatever you're comfortable with sharing, around um, preparing the, the mind and the body for going into the challenge of food reintroduction? One of the very first things you said to me in our first session around mindset and food is that when I sat down to eat my meal, of just saying to myself that this food is nourishing to me, this food is wonderful, my body loves it, my body receives this food. And as I was eating, it made me aware how oftentimes when I would eat, I would be nervous or I wasn't enjoying the food. It was, I was just eating it and taking a few breaths before I ate to put myself into a calmer state and then just sending loving energy into my body, into my mind, into my spirit, into my food, this wonderful stuff that's nourishing me. And within a few times of doing that, I, I really felt the difference of when the food was in my body. It's, it sounds odd, but it's like I could feel the food in my body like a lump. And then as I started talking to the food and almost blessing it and blessing myself and my body, when the food was in my body, I didn't really notice it. I felt this calmness. I just took these deep breaths around food and it was absolutely wonderful. And so every meal I would do that. And I still to this day do this all this time later. And, you know, I'm re I remind myself that something led to this, some point in my life, which I, you know, can look back and can see a few things. And I was also very, um, high strung in some ways. I was nervous about things. I was always jumping to the future, always putting my mind as very fast and going all over the place. And rarely was I in the present moment. And those things can cause some stress. And so there were things going on in my life that led to this. And would I have loved to just take antibiotics and be done with it and back to normal? Heck yes, I would have. 
but that's not not how this works. It's like that's your first phase where your first is is seeing what you have and then taking the right regime and and then it's about healing your body from what caused this and getting your body back into balance. And that's not something that's overnight. But there's always, and this has always been my motto through this, there is always a gift through any pain, through any suffering that we go through. We may not see it as we're in it in that moment. And believe me, there were times I did not see it. But now I look back and I can see the gifts. Yes, it it compartmentalized my life for a while because I was one of those people I didn't want to eat out. I didn't want to be that far from home. What if I was visiting someone and had a reaction? I don't want to, I, this began to rob me of my life. And it's like, screw that. <laughs> you know, no, I'm going, I'm going to figure this out. And that's the journey I'm still on. I'm, and, but I'm so much more empowered and I keep my mindset in the present. I don't jump to the future because I don't know what that's going to hold. And I, and I learn from my past experiences. It's such wise words and so important for us to, uh, it's so important for us to hear the stories of others to give us hope because there will be people listening today who are right at the start where you were, where you were having those huge reactions uh, and no one could really pinpoint it back in the day for you and they're there right now. And to know that you've gone from that place to a place where you're eating onion and garlic and able to go out and eat with friends and go to a restaurant or a cafe and not be so scared of of um, succumbing to a reaction. It It is so lovely to hear that. And I know when I was at the start, if I, you know, there weren't podcasts, there weren't websites, there was nothing, there was absolutely nothing, which is why I created The Healthy Gut because I was desperate to hear the stories of others to give me hope uh, that I could feel better one day and uh, hence why all of this was born. Uh, if you had um, sort of a, a passing um, or a final word or um, you know, an essence or anything like that that you would like to leave with the listeners of the Healthy Gut podcast today about, you know, what's possible or, uh, you know, what you've learned across these several years now that you've been dealing with this, what, what would it be to kind of leave as a parting message for them? I think the main thing is, you know, be your own advocate. And one of the things that I've learned with this histamine and with SIBO is that, yes, there are similarities within people, but there are more differences in the presentation of symptoms and reactions and what works for one people doesn't work for another person. You have to honor your own unique biome, if you will, and listen to that. And try not to get caught up. You know, we join Facebook groups and everything, which are a great amount of support for us. But then there are people there that it's easy for you to go into fear around what they're experiencing and remembering that that is their experience and not your own. You define and look at what affects you and don't get caught up into all the fear because there is light on the other side of this but you have to pay attention keeping a food journal is really incredible because it shows you um it shows you what does and does not work for you and keeping your mindset knowing that this is a moment in time this this horrible thing you're dealing with but it can and it will get better when I was looking at the beginning, I, I was just begging to find somebody that was managing their, just managing their SIBO, you know? Um, so I'm really glad to be able to say this to you guys and give you hope and let you know, yeah, it does take some work, but it is worth it because it can be managed and it can be healed. You know, just pay attention to your body and listen to it. It's, it's talking to you. And we might not achieve the most perfect results within a week, within a month, even within a year, but we do achieve progress. And even if that progress is small, it might be because the body has so much work to do to recover. So even if all you've achieved, as you might think all, uh, in a year is like a 20% improvement, 
hell, wouldn't you take that 20% improvement then going backwards 20%? What if you could get a 50% improvement from where you were? Every improvement is an improvement and it's a chance for you to feel better. And I see getting or learning about SIBO, I, I think I had SIBO from very young childhood, but learning about it and taking control finally for my health actually was the best thing that ever happened for me. I'm so glad I learned about SIBO because I now have control of things and I now live my life so differently to how I was and I'm a much healthier person today than I was both physically and mentally. And so my SIBO diagnosis was actually a blessing as I see it now. I didn't see it at the time. I was angry at the time that I had SIBO and why do I have it and nobody else does and it's not fair and, you know, ranty rant. But today I'm really grateful for it. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way. I'm healthier both mentally and physically than I've ever been through this SIBO journey. And um, so I completely concur with what you're saying on that. That's, That's true for me as well. Well, Leslie Patrick, thank you so much for coming on to the Healthy Gut Podcast today and sharing your own experience with uh, your SIBO experience, recovering from SIBO and so excitedly bringing it back foods like onion and garlic into your diet and now being able to eat out. (laughs) It's just so wonderful hearing those stories. And I know last time we had our coaching call, I I got off the call and I was almost skipping. I was so (laughs) happy for you to see the um, improvements the leaps and bounds that you've made with your own health. So thank you so much for coming and sharing it with my um, podcast community today. Thank you. Um, Thank you for asking me to be here to share this journey. I'm, I'm honored to do that. Honored. And thank you again for the support you've given me, Rebecca, because you have truly been instrumental in my healing journey as well. My pleasure. So there you go, guys. That was episode 99 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. And don't forget that you can get the full transcription of today's episode uh, just by joining as a member. That's free to join and you get the written transcript of all episodes in season three. And if you would like access to any of the resources that Leslie and I mentioned in today's episode, just head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast and you'll see the full show notes from today's episode. And it's also in the app you use to listen to this episode. Uh, I look forward to bringing you episode 100 next week. Uh, But until now, have a great week. Thanks, everybody. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast we would like to thank red lemon productions for the production and original music score of this podcast to find out more about their services head to redlemonproductions.com the healthy gut podcast is a production of the healthy gut thanks for listening